Or mom, no, no. How are you? Hey, uh, Con, I'm doing fine. I'm doing this fine. Is, here in the this office, is a, to, uh, escaping from a little bit of work here to talk with you. Cool. This is uh, Con Carroll. We are taping another episode of uh, Pros and Con. I have uh, Armando Lawrence, who is Big Tent Democrat, uh, blogs regularly at Talk Left. And that's been a while since we talked. Where is the office for you these days? New York. New York, okay. Cause Back in New balmy New York. Thank, thanks to global warming, it's 60 degrees today. You were you were in what Caribbean island the last time uh, I talked? Puerto to Rico. Puerto yes. Rico. Yes, we blogged from my home in Puerto Rico uh, those years ago. But, and did uh, you did you stop in Florida, or you went you went straight to New York? I work both in Florida and New York, and still in Puerto Rico. Frankly, I've got uh, I, I am on planes a lot every week, every month. Uh, I make a basically I'm in each of those spots at least uh, one part of the month. Gotcha. I think it's a, a good enough transition to our first topic, which is Mitt Romney's huge win in Florida. Uh, I think I think a big factor that's kind of been underreported by um, a lot of people today is is Rit, Mitt really got all those numbers with uh, a strong showing um, from the uh, the Cuban Committee down in in Miami and up uh, in, in Southern Florida. You know, people ask me what would the Cuban community do uh, in this election. I thought Newt had a pretty good relationship with the Cuban community. Well, it's not, it's give, me, give us an insight on that. He's very good. You know, Cubans, being a Cuban-American, by the way, uh, uh, the, the the one Cuban-American Democrat that you'll meet is me. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, the Cuban-American community likes, you know, hard, tough fighter types. Um, they like... Uh, the, the the makeup of Newt and his persona would, would say, thought I thought would be more appealing to the Cuban community than Mitt's more buttoned down. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, so uh, I approach. I, I, so so do you think maybe you know a lot of people talk about how Mitt's you know negative campaign may have hurt him, but talking to you, you know, if if, if uh, uh, Cuban voters are you know kind of open to to fighters with a with a tough edge, maybe maybe the negative, negative campaign uh, even helped Newt in that. I mean, helped Romney at that community. Oh yeah, I think that people if people thought that was going to hurt him with Cubans, they were wrong. Um, <laughs> they, they, they love that stuff, huh? We lo they love fighters. You know, listen, I love fighters too, but uh, uh, it, it, I'm not a, averse to this rough and tumble stuff myself. I know I know that the average voter might uh, say, "Ooh, negative campaigning," even though it's proven time after time that it works. But Cubans are not afraid of a negative campaign. But if you wanted to me to get my best guess, I think this little flap with Rubio might have had an effect too. That you Rubio do you want to run that bound for people just for just in case they forgot what happened? As I recall, the the uh, the, the New Gingrich uh, the end, campaign would ran uh, ads uh, accusing Romney of being anti-immigrant and a few other things. You might you would know more of the specifics than I. What I remembered was uh, Rubio denouncing the ad. Yeah, yeah Gingrich, no, he asked. He asked Newt to take it down, you know, which I thought that uh, was pretty pretty remarkable. I mean, uh, Rubio had been fairly studiously neutral in all of this, right? Uh, and, and he still never endorsed. Let's be clear about that. Yeah, but right. you know that, that that was a pretty big moment. I thought. Um, I think the other part of the Cuban makeup is we like uh, we're front runners. We like winners, and once it felt like uh, Mitt was going to win. I think there might have been more of a stampede out the door towards Romney. Right. I think. At, I think. At the end. I think related to that, you had uh, the the Ross Lightning, you know, machine down there in, in Florida, and, and Diaz Ballard. I mean, you have, you know, kind of uh, a rare urban turnout machine uh, among Republicans. No yeah. That's and they that's were, absolutely true. And and they they were both big Romney supporters early on. I mean, unlike Rubio, they were they were 100 percent behind Romney all along. Which is an interesting dynamic when you consider they both served uh, uh, with Newt as Speaker, and uh, they didn't feel they owed him the courtesy of sitting it out. But uh, that seems to be a phenomenon, and we could talk about. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, what? Well, yeah, I mean, phenomenon. that's huge. That I mean, I think that's huge. That you know, no one who really worked with Newt, except for except for I think J.C. Watts, really has come out and, and defended him. Um, what well, I, I saw McCollum on TV afterwards. Uh, Talking in favor of Newt and talking about uh, basically the well, we got him right where we want him moment. Uh, you know, uh, we just got beat by 15 points, but we got him right where we want him. Uh, so, 
And I think McCollum was a, was a manager of the impeachment in 97, which right, was actually right. pretty, it was a pretty funny moment where Lawrence O'Donnell, who is, I'm not a, that big a fan of, but I do like that he asked people uncomfortable questions, and he, he went at McCollum on, well, do you regret being having been an impeachment manager of the Clinton impeachment, et cetera, et cetera, which is a funny moment. But uh, at any rate, the Gingrich uh, situation is interesting, and uh, for me, I'm going to let you lead to the next topic. I hope we get to talk about it. I think uh, uh, Mondo. Mondo had some cell phone issues there. Yeah, I uh, did. Look, look, Here's my cell me, phone. There's the issue. <laughs> Let me ask you one more thing about um, you know Romney's good performance among uh, Cuban voters. Um, how far down on the issue is you know uh, immigration for them? Is it are, is it just because we're looking at you know uh, already Republican Cuban voters, or it, it just doesn't seem as though you know among a, a subset of uh, Latino Hispanic voters, um, the the immigration the amnesty issue just doesn't seem high on the radar for them. I, I have I, I have two observations about the immigration issue. The specifics of immigration policy are not high on their issue. The reason is we all get in. You know, if we make it to the to the uh, shores, we're we're uh, declared good Americans right away. So, oh, that's right. So it's it's kind of a different policy. For you, you guys, literally do have the. Um, yeah, the, 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 the dry foot policy, unlike, uh, unlike others. That's correct. But I will yeah, tell you there uh, is this, and that is on, on the tone issue um, and how people talk about immigrants, that does have an impact. I think that, that people underestimate the uh, notion maybe. that, well, sure the kind that. of language that sometimes you'll see. It's not that, okay, we, should, we want good immigration. Obviously, Cubans have always been a fairly popular immigrant group with Republicans by and large. Uh, but when we when you talk about people, and I you know and Latinos in a certain way, a lot of Cubans, even conservative Republican ones, don't love the when the tone gets denigrated. I think they're they're that's where there can be an issue. It's it's an interesting needle to thread. You can be tough on immigration. You can be for border security and things like that. The one thing I will say about Romney, I think he did master one thing that's important, and uh, and that is the way to talk about it without seeming to be denigrating. Sorry, I got to do right now. Latinos, and I, and I think that people did miss that, and I think they do miss that. I think that, in fact, Romney will do better with Latinos than the rest of the way that people realize. Because I think he does have a deft touch of talking tough on immigration policy without seeming to be denigrating Latin, Latino immigrants. So how would, how would you score his, uh, his self-deportation uh, rhetoric? How, how does that fit into with your... Uh, I, don't think um, it did not... any, I don't think it did him any damage with Latinos. It was, it, it was incomprehensible for the most part. <laughs> And I, to the degree that it was ridiculed, it was ridiculed by people who aren't going to be for Romney anyway, uh, people like me. Um, right, right. I, I didn't think it was an effective line. Uh, it's sort of like talking about Saul Alinsky. I mean, you know, between, other than you, me, and, you know, ten other people, who the hell knows who Saul Alinsky is? Right. No, no, I, I agree. You know, when you have, you know, uh, you know, Gingrich, for example, talking about uh, Spanish as the, the language of the ghetto, right? That's uh, a mistake. Said, right. Well, he never specifically said Spanish, but we all we all knew what he was talking about. Um, you know, and, and it's 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 that same rubric you get into. Whereas I think, you know, even though you know people went out by the the self deportation line, you know, at least it it casts uh, immigrants as their own agents, right? It it, it uh, shows that they're self sufficient enough to get here. Um, you know, shows that they're actively, you know, working. The rest of it, they're not, they're obviously not here to get wealth, or the rest of it, they're, uh, you know, just trying to work and get ahead. And it's, uh, you know, it's still not a message that a lot of them are here, but I, I think you're, you're right, it's just not blatantly insulting, as opposed to a lot of the other uh, rhetoric you hear on the issue. Yeah, I think that people uh, underestimate the importance of tone and attitude when discussing these policies on how it affects Latino attitudes. I think that if there was a mistake that Republicans have made since the Karl Rove, George Bush policy on, and I know that there were policy implications that people disagreed with on, on, on what Bush wanted to do on, on immigration, but they also missed that there's another aspect to the Bush family, not just George W. I think Jeb, older Bush, Bush 41 had it, and I think Rove understands it. There's got to be a way of talking about these issues 
without being demeaning. And a lot of Republican candidates miss that, and a lot of Republican commentators miss that. I think that you can do more on policy, be harsher even on policy than you would think, if you take the right tone, and uh, you know that's that that's my opinion, and I, and I think it bears out. I think that uh, a lot of what's happened with uh, drop-offs in Latino support for Republicans, generically, uh, in the last few years, is more about tone than it is about specific policy. Barack Obama has been the great deporter. Uh, of people. I mean, in terms of uh, the the implementation of policy, he's he's not really been better. I would you could argue he's been worse than the Bush administration by far on immigration policy. Uh, you can you can make that argument. This to transition to an area where where Romney has not exactly been deaf. Did you catch his uh, line about um, the poor this morning on CNN? That was a mistake. I, oh I, my God! I, I don't know why. If there's one thing I've seen about Romney, and one thing that George Bush 43 had, he was very disciplined. He would never make a mistake. And I know oh, people, yeah. he was dim-witted, in my opinion, maybe, uh, and not great on policy, but he was a very good politician, very good candidate who would never make mistakes like that. Romney's made too many of those mistakes. And yeah, I mean, just, just so everyone knows knows the line, you know, he's talking to, uh, what was it, it was uh, Soledad O'Brien, and the, and the line was... Uh, I'm, I'm not concerned about the very poor. I'm concerned about the 90% of Americans in between. You know, I, I don't care about the very poor or the very rich. Um, and, you know, you, you can kind of see what he's trying to say there. Um, he talks about how, you know, they, they have the safety net, and, and if it's broke, I'll fix it, right? Um, and there's just so much wrong with that from top to bottom. Um, you know, where to begin, it's... Uh, well, I mean, first of all, it, it's just a terrible thing to say. You, you don't care about anyone, especially if it, it's going to be the very poor. I, I'm sure in his head he was thinking, oh, well, then I'll follow it up with, I don't care about the very rich either, so so that'll be okay. But, you know, the, the whole line of thinking just, you know, reeks of the Occupy Wall Street, you know, 99%, we are the 99% divisiveness. It's just, well, a, just a terrible message. Yeah, a divisiveness on the side of the, you know, where, where, where he needs to not be. I, it, it was a shocking gaff is a shocking mistake. I don't know if it will have long-term implications. It will if he can't fix those types of mistakes. It seems surprising. I don't know if, if after some success he just gets loose and, and loses his, his discipline. Um, it, it, it was a surprising statement and uh, I don't know that it's going to hurt him you know, anytime soon, but it's certainly something that he has to shore up for in November. I mean, there's just no doubt about that. Right. You know, I, I mean, there's been, you know, some great analysis on, I think, you know, HEO said, you know, it, what Mitt was really trying to say was that, you know, the uh, poor have a safety net. Uh, it's generous enough as it is, and so we don't we need to bother, bother with it. Uh which, which is, you know, kind of exactly what he's trying to say. But, you know, yep. from a conservative perspective, it's, it's just exactly wrong. I mean, conservatives have a, a huge problem with the way Medicaid is run currently. Uh, you know, it crowds out private insurance for, you know, those, uh, for, uh, you know, more poor Americans. Uh, uh, they don't pay the doctors enough. Uh, you know, combined, you know, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, they're, they're all going bankrupt. Uh, I mean, the, the, the social safety nets in, in tatters, it, it definitely needs to be fixed. I mean, you would never catch Paul Ryan saying, if the, uh, the social safety net is in trouble, we'll fix it. You know, Paul Ryan's line is, you know, the social safety net is, is about to be ripped apart. You know, we, we, we can't afford it. We absolutely need fundamental reform right now. And, well, and I, I, I guess Romney just doesn't even think that way. Well, I, it, it's an interesting... I would say that you're... You just gave me the Heritage Foundation analysis of it. I, I was looking at it more from the pure politics. Um, because Paul Ryan, if he was running for president, wouldn't say a lot of things he says. Uh, here's the, and, and if I may drive you to a, a article I read today that I just forwarded to you, the thing about electability in the Daily Caller from this fellow Yates Walker. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, one, here's one thing that I don't know if you had a chance to review it, but I, no, I did. I did. I looked at it. Yeah, he says that we never looked at the electability issues. We, as Democrats, when it was Barack Obama and uh, and Hillary Clinton or whoever, and that conservatives are getting conned by the liberal media that electability is an issue. But that that's simply not true. First of all, on the first aspect of it, we very much considered 
the electability well, issues with regard to w Obama and Clinton. And uh, personally, my personal point of view was I was for Obama because I thought he was more electable. I didn't think there was a dime's worth of difference between them in, in terms of policy. And I don't think a Hillary Clinton presidency would be any different than an Obama presidency now. But the the if you really are, if the, and I take the underlying point of the argument of that article is, we are getting conned into supporting Mitt Romney where we could be supporting Gingrich or suppose that maybe he's for Santorum. But that's not... Look, Santorum, maybe you could argue that he didn't have high negatives, but Gingrich, in my view, is unelectable. And I think most Republican strategists under, uh, understand that. And while there's this aspect of, well, what does Mitt Romney mean with, uh, with, with what I just termed the Heritage Foundation analysis? Um, you still have to look at whether the guy can be elected or not. Now, uh, <laughs> if the, what, is, what is Mitt Romney going to do? I don't know that much of anything anybody says in a campaign ends up being a governing document anymore with either Obama or Romney. Yeah, I mean, look at look at Obama ran against the individual mandate, and then ended up being the core of Obamacare. Yeah, I, I I don't worry about what either one of these two. These guys are, they're both, frankly, I think at the end of the day, fairly mainstream. And I'll I'll probably be saying the opposite of that once Romney's nominee, and I'll be calling him an extremist. <laughs> but today, talking to you and I, I think in his heart he's fairly, you know, mainstream politician. I, I think he'll probably try to do what he thinks is going to work best. I'll probably disagree with what he, a lot of what he thinks is going to work best. But a, it's not a revolutionary uh, politician with revolutionary ideas. He's not Paul Ryan. Okay, and he's not even Newt Gingrich, even if there are a few good things that you might think Newt Gingrich's ideas you might like. You know, the, I think most of what Newt Gingrich says is fairly off the wall and not very that coherent, but that's my point of view. You know, you can argue about Paul Ryan or, uh, or other fairly conservative stalwart thinkers who might be in the political game. But, you know, with Obama, these are fairly pragmatic people. They were that. They will be that. I think that the, the big difference in what the election will probably come down to in terms of policy is there's going to be Supreme Court vacancies. Um, and these guys will be, either one of them will pick ideological uh, people who will tip the balance of the court. I, I do think that this is a Supreme Court election, if anything. Well, I got, I got two, you know, kind of reactions to, uh, to that line. You know, one is I think the you know, conservatives' big problem when you start talking about electability is, you know, conservatives don't really have a dog in this fight. You know, all of the candidates we have right now are you know, compromised in some way. You know, you know, Newt Gingrich is out there defending Medicare Part D in the middle of a debate. Um, he's defending, not only is he defending Freddie Mac, he's defending the entire government-sponsored entity way of, of providing services. That's just completely antithetical to the Tea Party right now. Uh, you know, then you have Rick Santorum, who voted for all of, you know, George Bush's crap. Um, no Child Left Behind. Uh, he, he voted for Medicare Part D. He voted for, you know, he supported the steel tariffs. Um, yeah, the, right the, 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 the bridge to nowhere. It, all that big government stuff, you know, has, has Santorum's vote on it. So Good conservatives vote. don't really have anybody in this fight that they can go, that, that's our guy. So it has to turn to something, and, and that, that something's electability. Well, I think it's interesting because they turned it into stopping Romney, which I found right. to be well, fascinating. For some of them, for some of them, for some, some of, of them, them, not all of them, yes. Some of them, yeah, and, and I thought that was fascinating. They made Romney the doppelganger for everything they hate, and I think Romney is, as you, as you noted, there's not, I don't think there's that much difference between them, at least on what they say their policy is. You know, it's hard to imagine Newt Gingrich's presidency because God... I mean, to me, who knows what the hell he would do? Santorum? No, absolutely. I think, I, I think you know, going to your earlier part about this being a, uh, you know, Supreme Court vacancy election, I, I think that's one reason. It really kind of large, not just Supreme Court, but I think one reason that uh, conservatives should be okay with Romney, as opposed to Newt Gingrich, or, or even more comfortable with him than than Obama, is that you know, uh, Obama and Gingrich are both, both kind of arrogant. You know, know it alls. They they know they always know they're the smartest person in the room and that they're right, right? And so they're gonna you know do what they want to do, no matter what the base or anyone else thinks. Whereas that's not Mitt Romney. You know, Mitt Romney's very much of a, a weather vane. 
So if he gets elected, you know, what, what conservatives have to do, what the activist base knows they have to do, is they know they have to keep up the fight. They know that they have to keep communicating to the Romney administration that, you know, if they cross him, if they cross him in any way, you know, his right, his life's going to be a living hell. And so I, I think uh, for many conservatives, they, they trust Romney on, on nominations. They trust Romney on policy because they know, you know, uh, he, he's not going to cross them. He no, can't I, afford to. No, I think that's so obvious that the, 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 the reminder everyone will give him is 1992 when Bush 41 betrayed the base on tax increases and that was in Buchanan ran and did all the things that happened. Uh, that Mitt Romney's not going to do that. He's not. He will give you the Supreme Court nominate, nominee. He, he, I think philosophically he doesn't believe in tax increases, period, so he'll fight for the Bush tax cuts. Um, and he'll try to rein in safety net spending. I mean, you know, in a, in a middle of the road situation, which the president has to be, I, I don't know what more they want. I mean, it would seem to me that it, that it would be a no-brainer for any Republican to support Romney. I think it's a no-brainer for any Democrat to support Obama because of the Supreme Court. And I do believe that he will at least try to fight on the tax issue for us. And to me, it, you don't have to go much further than that to say what this election's about, taxes and the Supreme Court. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, would, I would think that, you know, this is probably a... a as you would put it, a Heritage Foundation frame that you you and I lock. But I, I do think it will be a, a, a choice election between you know whether we want a uh, a, a European welfare state um, that is you know more heavily uh, regulated. You know, I mean, if you look at you know Dodd Frank, if you look at Obamacare, it really is kind of a corporatist model of we're going to select you know seven insurance companies, heavily regulate them, turn them into utilities, and have them on the healthcare sector. We're going to identify 10 or 11 too big to fail banks, turn them into utilities, and have them run the financial sector. You know, that, that's the Obama, Tim Geithner corporatist model. And then you're going to have the Republicans saying, no, let's have more of a ground up, uh, more choice in health care, more health savings accounts, uh, let people buy or not buy whatever coverage they want to buy, let them have whatever financial institute, institutes they need, and let's let's order ourselves that way. So uh, that, I, I think, think is, the, is the choice we're going to have. Okay, I think that's a very interesting analysis. I don't know if that's a choice we have, but I really liked the Heritage Foundation, and not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, <laughs> description of what Obama's exchange mandate, it is exactly right, regulated, in theory, utilities with uh, in this corporatist exchange structure. Uh, and interestingly enough, as you know, you're not pleased with it. A lot of us aren't pleased with it for a couple of reasons. We don't think the regulatory model works very well in the insurance framework. Uh, right. I, and uh, we think that it's less efi uh, uh, efficient. So neither one of us is particularly happy with that. But why? Uh, but, but to take point to, I really, I do really appreciate that description of it as opposed to, you know, socialized medicine, which it's more corporatist medicine than it is. It's, it's corporate insurance anyway. But no, yeah, the, that's exactly what it is. I'm both on I'm in both the healthcare and the financial front. Right. So, but the but the second is why would you uh, think? Do you think Romney's going to be forced to repudiate what a model that I think he thought was a good idea in Massachusetts? Because and is the justification going to be federal versus state? Oh uh, no, I, I do think he, he he's going to have to. Right. There's I mean as long as the Republicans have the the House. And uh, you know, if they get to 50, 50 in the Senate, he's going to have to follow through with some major dismantling of, of Obamacare. Um, the, the base doesn't allow him to, to do anything else. That's interesting. And, and uh, you know, I mean, if you look at the rest of the the healthcare system, uh, you know, Medicaid particularly, um, I mean, and especially if the if the mandate falls through, I mean, there's just so much of this that that's not going to work and is going to demand some major retooling. Right, I mean, this Medicaid is already driving the states bankrupt. Uh, you know, without the the mandate, if the Supreme Court goes that way, um, the rest of Obamacare is not going to be affordable. So, this is not something he's going to be able to ignore, and it's it's going to have to choose a different direction. I think that's that's actually pretty that's pretty convincing that he's going to be forced by the base for all the reasons we've talked about to to uh, do all he can 
to undo uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act. I shouldn't call it Obamacare because I'm <laughs> the A team. I shouldn't go for that. Sorry, right, but right. I, I got to call it the the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Con. Well, since, since we're talking about the base, um, do you want to go ahead and talk about um, Eric Erickson and, and Marcos uh, Mulutius since we're, since we're on the subject? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I was uh, preparing for this. I, I, I was looking at some of the things you had written, and I, written and, I, and I ran across one that I remembered from a year ago. In which yeah, you, it was a year ago. I was surprised you still, you still had that article. Yeah, it's right here. Uh, January 25th, 2011, just a little over a year ago, and, it, and you titled it Marcos Mulitsis, Democratic Power Broker. Uh, and I, I think it had to do with something about a press secretary, and, 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 and frankly, it was about the the influence that, that Marcos was uh, wielding in certain situations. And what brought it to mind to me was the very interesting role that someone you and I know for many years, uh, uh, before I knew him before he became famous, uh, Eric Erickson of Red State, and of course the mainstream media, CNN, uh, uh, designated conservative analyst uh, and of the Red State uh, blog, and his role in this uh, primary election has been fascinating. I think just to take one in, one moment and uh, just to get your reaction to it. Sure. You, rem you remember the day before Rick Perry? Uh, dropped out and endorsed Gingrich? Yes. Eric yes. Erickson wrote a, a well-traveled post saying Rick Perry should drop out and endorse Gingrich. Yes. I mean, what is it? Well, what do you think that was about? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, he was obviously very tied into the Perry camp, right? I mean, he was the one who um, got Perry to come to the Red State Gathering and announce his candidacy there. So, so you know, he, in a, in a sense, in a somewhat real sense, he was key to recruiting Perry to, to get into the race. Um, so he, he was obviously tightened the Perry camp from the beginning, obviously had some good place sources there. Uh, so yeah, I, I do think that uh, the Perry team, you know, had him as a, uh, a trusted advisor from the beginning. And so, um, you know, so he, I, I don't think I don't think he had veto power, you know, he wasn't like a Spinjali where, you know, he was a jump and Perry said hi. But he was definitely, you know, tied into the um, decision-making process and, and definitely had a voice there. Well, that's interesting. The optics of it, though, were kind of funny. And uh, um, to have him say, you should do this, and then have him do it the next day. But let me tell you this way. If I was Rick Perry's people, I wouldn't have been that pleased with the way that played out. It, it, <laughs> it really looked like Garrettson said, jump, and Perry said, how high. Right. But, you know, at that point, you, Charlie. What what's Rick Perry's future? I don't know. It, it's not going to be. Uh, well, it's not good in Texas. He's he he went from you know high favorabilities to now he's uh, I think a good double digits underwater down there. Favorability wise. Right, right. That uh, it, it's it's still Texas, and he's going to be. I mean, they're not. He's not going to be challenged presumably in a Republican primary. But no, no. Uh, but I mean, is that it? He'll never be a national figure again. This was his one shot. Yeah, I, I think he's done. Um, you know, we get to get back to the, to the Marcos article you wrote earlier. You know, I would I was kind of just using Marcos as a um, as an example. I mean, you, it, there, it's part of a larger uh, argument I was making about the role of um, the net roots and um, you know the, the right roots as well. More of the online kind of taking over um, the role the party once had, and the parties once had, and that you know the parties are weakening. And, uh, you know, you see more and more functions being taken over by, you know, non-party and quasi-party entities like, like super PACs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, Marcos and Eric serve um, as important, uh, you know, markers on that trail. Um, you know, when you look at the uh, Eric's relationship with the Perry campaign, uh, he, he, you know, candidate recruitment is a big part of what parties do. And he definitely helped recruit Perry into the race. Now, of course, it didn't work out well, but, you know, let's pretend that Perry could actually debate and put two sentences together. You know, if, if he does well in those early debates, you know, we have a very different primary right now that, that could be looking at a President Perry. And, um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, Marcos has ever, you know, played that on a, a presidential level. You know, he definitely can't be blamed or given any credit for getting uh, Obama into the race. But Marcus has definitely recruited a lot of candidates um, at the, the Senate and 
uh, house level, uh, and, and and not just Marcos, but the, but the net roots more more generally. And I think I think both uh, Marcos and Eric have have played uh, big roles in you know kind of bringing a more uh, populist tone to both or, both their respective parties. I think that's that's a, a fair statement, and uh, just to be completely fair with with my disclosures, I I'm now a featured writer again at Daily Coast, and I've uh, been involved in uh, the Daily Coast Radio Project on Sirius FM. So take whatever I say with a grain of salt. I'm going to be supportive of Marcos here. <laughs> uh, I think Marcos is uh, it. I think one of the more interesting aspects of it, Marcos is. Uh, um, a little more pragmatic than, than Eric. Um, it, it may be pragmatic, may it sound like sellout, but... Can you, can you give me an example of that? I think that he's... I think the, the treatment of Obama... There's, there's things that Obama... That has to grate Hello? every progressive. Hey, Dan. For um, example. Uh, I think that the, the way health care went, believe it or not... In my view, had to great okay. progressives. I mean, we. I, I don't think that the exchange model was what anybody had in mind. I, I, I'm still trying to figure out how it, how that became the blueprint. Uh, um, I'd love to read the book. Okay, let me see. Um, I'll go further. The the issues on civil liberties. He hasn't okay. been um, very good on them. Uh, detainee policy. At, at first, there were some good statements made. But there's been no follow through. Um, there hasn't been uh, any real attempt to comply oh, oh, with okay. what so I believe were the constitutional obligations. I think Libya was another situation where he simply did not act in a progressive fashion. Maybe yeah, this happens you know, with him where it becomes a question. Or fine, wrong. Actually. Um, uh, but I never thought of Obama as any more than a fairly centrist uh, Democrat anyway. So it should have been surprising. They are, yes. But so for those who had a different uh, vision of, of Obama as a Thursday more progressive the best out of the three. Uh, figure, I got to believe there's a lot that uh, that they have to be disappointed with. I will go further. I think that the though uh, okay. the public study might have been too harsh Sounds on the great. banks. You know, well, progressive nice, thinks yeah. quite the opposite that he was too easy on the banks. Uh, and maybe that's where he wants to be. Maybe that's his sweet spot. Uh, but, you know, here we are, it's election year, and none of us, including me, are not going to, we're not going to beat up Obama now. Particularly since, frankly, he's now sounding the way we wanted him to sound for four years. Uh, at least me personally, I think since August, since the fight of the dead ceiling, he's been the candidate I wanted. I wish he would have been more of that as when he was president. Uh, and maybe not even on policy, but at least rhetorically, fighting for the ideas, fighting to, to, uh, level our tax code, fighting to say we need to do more to help homeowners, uh, fighting for uh, the issue of fairness and, uh, and uh, not letting it all the, the, our entire structure be about the very rich to the exclusion of the be of benefits to everybody else. Now, you know, I've, I've engaged in a polemic here, but that's, that's, that's <laughs> you know, what we wanted to hear from our politicians, the polemic about our point of view, you know what I mean? And now we're hearing it, but we're, we're not going to talk about the, when he did do that. Whereas I think Eric, as uh, recently as last week, will keep telling me, I guess he's saying the race is still on, so he's just killing Romney every day. Uh, he kills Santorum, calls him a big government conservative, uh, even now, uh, and even to, you know, there, there's not that much love for Gingrich, really. It's, it, that To me, there's not a lot of pragmatism. And at, at a certain point, you say, well, you know, it's election time. Let's look at the positives. You know what I mean? That, that to me, is where I think Marcus can be more pragmatic than Eric. Yeah, no, I can see that. I, I will say this, though. I, I think definitely since he got the CNN contract, his rhetoric has been a lot more responsible. On TV. He, I, I think on the blog too. Yeah, yeah I, maybe you, too. You, you don't, yeah, you don't right. see him. Yeah, you don't see him saying a lot of the uh, crazy inflammatory things that you did before. I th I, so I think it's it's made him a bit more responsible uh, rhetorically. Um, and as as far as him tearing everyone down, uh, I, I think it's kind of more to his credit. I think you know he's he's just been honest. I mean, I, I think if you're an honest conservative, you're looking at this field and you're like, oh my God, are these really our choices? 
Um, so, you know, so far he, he hasn't saluted, which, which I think is, you know, maybe not what, what Marcos is, but it's definitely kind of more like your style. I mean, you were never one to, uh, you know, contend your criticisms before Obama or even, in, in, or even Hillary. Um, okay. But, but you know, you know, come, come, come general election time, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure uh, Eric's going to be right on message. It could be. It could be that I'm just forgetting what I did in 2008. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I don't remember you saluting. That's true. That's a good point. So that that is a glass house I'm just throwing from here. Um, that 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 may be, and I think you're right. Um, but I do think this. And I, 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 it, let me take the strange position of saying, you know, I don't understand the notion that Mitt Romney is such a terrible Republican. I, maybe, I know you can always pick things out of people's past. When he was running for Senate in Massachusetts against Ted Kennedy, he wasn't bragging about being a staunch Reagan conservative. I mean, come on. What did you expect him to do? Uh, to me, that that's sort of the part that, that, that I find somewhat not honest. I mean, it's easy to be a, uh, the Republican conservative candidate in Texas. It's not easy to be that in Massachusetts. I mean, here, here's a question uh, for you. Massachusetts, <laughs> Scott Brown. Scott Brown. and Not looking good. Not looking good, but more than not that. Not looking good. Is he going to be supported by, by the conservative base nationally? Are you guys going to rally to his defense? And if so, won't that be more about Elizabeth Warren and less about thinking Scott Brown's so great? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, other stuff going on, uh, you know, including the the race. I mean, I think I think Warren's going to get a lot more um, liberal blog love than Brown, than Brown will get conservative love. But I think that has more to do with her just being a perfect fit for oh, your guys her. and your message Absolutely. than than whether or not we you know like Brown. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of uh, you know open seats. I mean, looking at it now, you know. Republicans have a good shot to take over. I mean, these are all these are all gains for Republicans, right? Nebraska, yeah. North Dakota, Missouri, Montana, Virginia, Wisconsin, New Mexico, Florida, Hawaii, Ohio. Uh, those are all legitimate targets for Republicans. You know, well, Nebraska is beyond. Yeah, you know, some of those are right. Right. There's, there's no question. And then if you look at stuff we have to defend, it's it's Massachusetts and and Nevada, and that's it. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of bound, brand, bandwidth that, that Brown has to compete with. You know, all those races, you know, plus the top of the ticket. Um, so, yeah, he, he's going to have a rough time getting getting conservative blogger love and with, with all that uh, activity around. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and conversely, as you said, excuse me, um, Elizabeth Warren will be the signature race for the block. There's just no doubt about it. Right. right. She, and, she's, your, she's your guy's new Russ Feingold. Absolutely. No question. And the, the beauty of it from our perspective is that uh, it, it's a race in Massachusetts. <laughs> what, what better state to run that that, can, that candidate in? You know, see, we're being uh, ideological and pragmatic at the same time. Exactly. Well, Armando, it's been great talking to you. Okay. All right. Uh, we're bumping up against 40 minutes here, and uh, we'll have to do this again. Hopefully uh, not a, not a three-year gap next time. You know, absolutely, and uh, as I told you, we're going to be relaunching Daily Coast Radio, and uh, we would love to have you come on and talk to us on that as well. Yeah, sure. I don't see why not. No, yeah, absolutely. We'll mix it up with you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Take care of yourself. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.